Yes. Okay, I'm going to walk around if I may. Sure. Uh, okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, and, and uh, it's very a very important moment to be here, a very important issue to discuss, particularly after the the election of the horrendous uh, uh, Bolsonaro to Brazil, which you know in a way. In, in a curious way, is consistent with some of the developments that have been occurring over the last two or three years in Latin America. So, I've been thinking about. I was thinking about how I could uh, begin this this discussion, and, and the only way to begin is to address honestly what the situation is. Um, the book I've, I've written is called *The Ebb of the Pink Tide*. Maybe I should start with that and say what why what is the pink tide? Why the pink tide? I think as a phrase it was coined slightly contemptuously by an American journalist, really dismissing the rise and growth and expansion of extraordinary social movements across Latin America. But for us, the pink tide has to be an event of extraordinary political importance and significance because of the way in, in the moment in which emerged. I mean, the 90s were a period across the world of the, of the, of the expansion of global capitalism, of a, a neoliberalism uh, as ruthless as, as capitalism at as it, as its worst. It was a decade when uh, the, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall and, the, and, the, growing, and the, the new confidence of global capital expressed in that, in that famous idea uh, advanced by Francis Fukuyama at the end of the 80s, which said we have now reached the end of history. What he really meant by that was we have reached the end of a history of class conflict, and in fact from now on capitalism will, will, will march across the world unin, unencumbered and uninhibited by resistance, by struggle. Uh, this will be, that was the, he meant, what he meant by the end of history, and for the 90s it looked a little like that. It certainly looked as though, as in Latin America, for example, the, persist, the consistent dismantling of the state, the, the, um, the imposition of a new agro-export agro agriculture, uh, of new export agriculture, which in its turn expelled millions from the land, millions of small farmers and peasants from the land, uh, as they gravitated towards the, the, you know, the, the hillside barriers in the great cities of Latin America. Um, work in, in industrial production where it existed virtually ceased and those who worked there became part of a great army of unemployed who either uh, marched northwards across the border or they also joined their fellows in these in these uh, in the in the shacks of, of the of the hillside barriers that was the 90s and at that point I imagine those who uh, who, who organized Global capitalism felt extremely confident. There seemed to be little in the way of resistance. NAFTA was formed, the new regional organizations in which imperialism imposed its rules around the world. The World Trade Organization emerged, an organization which many of us hadn't heard of until 70,000 people demonstrated outside it in, 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 in Seattle in 1999. But the World Trade Organization quietly, secretly imposed the rules of this new order. And among its many rules were that there should be no loans, no uh, financial assistance to any spending, to any form of public spending. In fact, state subsidies, public spending had to be reduced to a minimum. That was the condition of survival in, the, in a world dominated by the WTO, among many other things. The other thing was the privatization of everything, even down to our very genes they were trying to privatize. That was the, the era of privatization and of globalization. When did it end? I think it ended with what we call the pink tide. Um, I suppose the first event of the pink tide, you could say, was the election of a, of a young military officer in Venezuela to the presidency of that country. The fact that it was Venezuela is significant. One, because Venezuela, of course, is a major oil-producing <coughs> company. Its entire e economy rests on the production of oil, and it was run by um, a, a coalition of two parties which had reached an agreement 45 years earlier that they would swap power between them and keep the loyalty of the people they were interested in by providing some of the, some of the benefits of oil, a minor proportion of the benefits of oil. Uh, meanwhile, by, um, by the end of the 90s, Venezuela, this country floating on a sea of wealth, was also a country, 60% of whose population was, was moving into what the UN described as extreme poverty. The first evidence of that was a kind of riot or an insurrection of the urban barriers um, in 1989. It was called the Caracaso, you know, the blow with Caracas. 
At the time, it was crushed easily, leaving some 3,000 dead, but it was repressed very easily. But it was a sign, perhaps, of things to come, not just in terms of resistance, but in terms of the, the kinds of organizations, the kinds of mobilizations that would, that would occur just a year later. Um, Hugo Chavez was elected to the presidency, much to the surprise and consternation of the Venezuelan middle class. There was a word they used about him which may not have much resonance here, but in Venezuela has enormous resonance. They said, but he's ugly. And what they meant, of course, you know, the white middle class of Venezuela by ugly meant that he was, that he was dark skinned and they had, that he had indigenous features. That was the, the kind of loathing, and it's very difficult unless you've been there, to, to communicate <coughs> the level of rage, sheer blind rage that Chavez engendered in that, in that bourgeoisie. But anyway, he came to power, to the presidency, with a program of, of actually quite modest, moderate changes. Um, uh, but with, with a, a long-term intention of using uh, Venezuela's oil wealth to benefit the majority, in other words, through programs of social assistance and welfare and so on. That was, that was the limit of the original program, together with uh, uh, a new constitution which should, among other things, protect human rights and the rights of indigenous peoples. It was very important. But, I think probably what nobody realized at the time, what the centrally most important clause of that constitution was going to be. The first thing is, it was a constitution written by a congress of delegates who, had been, who, who were elected in local assemblies and, and elected to, to be members of that constitutional assembly. And when it came out, perhaps the most significant clause in the long term was the clause that said the new Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela will be a participatory democracy. Now that was critical because it, it kind of it, it, it predicted what would be the central issue for the new movements as they arose. But really the big, the qualitative leap came not in Venezuela but in, Bol in Bolivia. In Bolivia in the city of Cochabamba, uh, a city of uh, small factories surrounded by, <coughs> by, uh, by small, peasants, uh, small peasant farms, indigenous communities. It had universities. It had um, uh, coca farmers in the, in the region. Um, but the city of Cochabamba had a private, had a, a water company, the state, uh, a publicly owned water company ran water in Cochabamba. The government, a government completely subordinated to, completely loyal to, to, uh, to neoliberalism, announced the privatization of the water company of Cochabamba. And the response was a rising of protest, but much more than protest. It, it was a movement that drew together peasant farmers, indigenous peoples, local workers, students, people living in their neighborhoods, for all of whom, for all of whom, and here, you know, the, the phrase in English would be, it was the last straw. Because among the clauses in the contract was one clause which said the company could claim ownership even of the rain. And there's a wonderful film which I recommend you to go and see called Even the Rain, which is about what happened in Cochabamba. But the result was a new movement emerged which brought together all those sectors. It was led by a, a young anarchist worker in a, from a small shoe factory called Oscar Oliveira, and together they formed a, th a, a committee called the Committee for Water and Life, and they began to fight back. It was, even if at the very beginning it wasn't clear, it became very clear very quickly that this was a battle not over a local resource, but a battle against the very direction that capitalism was taking. It was anti-capitalism in its very heart, in its very essence. They fought back, they fought the, the military, they fought the police, the, uh, many, there were a number of deaths in the great demonstrations, but eventually the Cochabamba water war was won by the movement from below. The, the, the uh, Bechtel was, the, co the contract was withdrawn from Bechtel and control of water was passed to an elected local committee. It was the beginning of something which we now can call the pink tide. It moved, in, in Bolivia itself, um, uh, in subsequent years, in, in 2000, this was in the year 2000, in 2001, 2003, similar movements occurred and clawed back the attempt to privatize water in the city of Los Altos, which is an indigenous city above La Paz. Uh, 
they fought over the over the, over gas and the distribution of uh, of, uh, of of the uh, of the profits of gas and so on. But the the critical thing in in Ecuador, what had begun in 19, 1990 as an indigenous a unified indigenous movement by 1999 had reached a level of mobilization and strength and coordination with trade unions, which enabled it to bring down a government, not for the, not only, not just once but three times to bring down governments who, who attempted to dollarize and integrate the Ecuadorian economy into the global economy. They fought and they won. Now, it, it's important to compare six years earlier and six years later. What, you know, what in 1999 was a world still dominated by a, a confident and rampant global, global capitalism was now confronting, at least in Latin America, significant movements from below. And the, the, uh, I mean, there's another moment in this, in this six-year period which is so significant, which for me is very important. Uh, Chavez was elected to the presidency with essentially a kind of radical democratic program. Uh, but his, his promise to nationalize oil, to take oil under state control, was sufficient to, to, uh, to, to provoke the rage and ire of, of the old ruling classes, of the, of the uh, a capitalist class in, in, um, in Venezuela, and of their masters, mostly in, in New York and Washington. And so, in 2002, there was a, a, an attempt to, bring, to, to destroy the government of Chavez, an attempted coup. Uh, as it happens, there was an Irish television uh, company in the, in the presidential palace uh, filming a documentary of Chavez when the attempted coup took place. Um, and therefore, they filmed the whole thing. So um, the film shows the head of the Venezuelan equivalent of the, of the CBI, the boss's organization, the employer's organization, standing there with a glass of champagne in his hand and saying, well, you know, I, much against my will, I had no desire to be president, but uh, these people, and he pointed to the cardinal and the generals and the other people around him, insist that I take on... Uh, unexpectedly, I have, I have now been asked and have accepted the invitation to become president of Venezuela. And then he put his hand in his pocket and pulled out a presidential sash, as if to say, well, I just happen to have one with me, so now I'm president. Well, his presidency lasted exactly 48 hours. And the reason it lasted 48 hours was immensely significant in, in, in the terms of, of the pink tide, because the Irish camera uh, people swung the camera to the windows of the palace and looked out into the street. And out in the street was an accumulating crowd of, at that point, about half a million people gathering around the presidential palace. And from their, from their faces and their dress, you knew these were the people from the barrios. And they had come down and from the slums, the shanties, and said, we are here and we are staying until we get our president back. They got their president back. The coup makers disappeared and, and took refuge, as always, in Miami and Panama, and, and Chavez came back. The next two or three years were moments of, of radicalization, because if we're going to talk about the Bolivarian revolution in Venezuela, then I think we need to be clear what, what we mean by a revolution. A revolution is a moment when the masses of ordinary people, when the majority of, of, of the population begin to become the owners and the governors of their own destiny. And that began to happen in Bolivia with the Colombian water, with the Cochabamba water war. And in, in Venezuela, it began to happen when, in a sense, the people massed in the streets got, you know, brought back the, 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 the person they regarded as their representative and their voice in government, which is Hugo Chavez. So by the time we get to 2005 to 6, the panorama, the picture in Latin America is of rising social movements embracing all sorts of sectors sectors which for many in, in many cases have never really been central actors in, in 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 the political life the indigenous communities the poor the barrios and so on who were now gathering together drawing together and fighting against the system fighting for a transformation of their societies. It was, it, the, the politics of it was not, not particularly clear, but what was clear was that they were not, that they were fighting against the experience of the previous decade. They were against globalization. They were against global capitalism. And their priorities were social justice, the, the redistribution of wealth to the mass of ordinary people, all right, and the democratization of their society. And that democratization was not simply 
as it were, electing new and better people to the state. That democratization was expressed in the way they conducted the fight. It wasn't just the demands they made, it was the way they organized. Because these were all, these, they organized in profoundly democratic, horizontal ways. Consulting, uh, one ex perhaps the exemplary one was that in, uh, in Bolivia there was a, an ancient tradition called the Cabildo Abierto, which is the, you know, the open town council. In squares and assemblies, people gathered to make decisions and to insist that those decisions be, be, be fulfilled. So the, the logic of that moment in the pink tide was not just resistance in and of itself, but resistance and the creation of new types of organs of resistance and organization, a new way of organizing which expressed itself in the demand for democracy. Because if you demand democracy when all you have is uh, available to you is a parliamentary election, that means one thing. But when you're talking about and demanding democracy, when democracy is being exercised in the streets and the public space by growing organizations of ordinary people unifying against the priorities of neoliberalism, then that's a very different kind of democracy. That comes close to what to that comes close to what you know we uh, socialists describe as self-emancipation. That is the moment when when the mass of ordinary people become take charge of their own destiny. That was the the panorama. That's how it looked, and that's why the pink tide has been was such a, a significant moment for all of those of us who see ourselves as as uh, uh, who, who wish to see the world transformed. Now, if I were to leap ahead to now, I would have to say that the optimism of that moment is not reflected in in in, in the current reality of Latin America. Those governments, uh, the, the these movements, brought new. Uh, new leaders in, 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 to the state. In, in uh, Bolivia, Evo Morales, a man of, of indigenous background, a man whose family had been part of the Bolivian mining industry and who then became the leader of the trade union of the coca farmers in, in Bolivia, was elected the first ever indigenous, well, there was an indigenous vice president, but the first indigenous president of Bolivia in a country 65% of whose population is indigenous. So, um, so his election was enormously significant in a symbolic way, and his commitment to, um, to the redistribution of the wealth derived from natural resources was also enormously significant. In, um, in, in, in Venezuela, the post-coup period had brought a series of quite, quite radical moves, including, most significantly, the creation of new organizations called the Missions, which really were a kind of parallel state. At least they were in that moment. Because the state, as, as Chavez had made very clear, the state in Venezuela was an, it was an instrument under the control of the old ruling classes. Uh, it was really a, a machinery for distributing favors in exchange for, in exchange for, for power. That's what it, how it functioned. And Chavez was deeply critical of it and said that we have to aspire to a completely different kind of state which is encapsulated in the idea of a participatory democracy. That was the hope. And when he was elected again to the presidency in 2006 with 62% of the popular vote, that seemed to be the perspective. So that was the logic of the pink tide. That was the, 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 the kind of driving force <coughs> behind these movements. That is, the direct involvement of the mass of ordinary people in determining, in determining their own lives. If we look back now from the perspective of 2018-19, uh, the, the picture is, uh, I mean, I, have to, I, I can't find a way around it. The, 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 the picture is bleak, especially if you look to Venezuela. If we look to Venezuela, what we see is, is, a, is a government run by uh, a group of people who claim to be the inheritors of the, of the Chavista uh, promise, claim to be revolutionaries. They call themselves socialists. They say they're em embarking on the creation of socialism. Yet if we examine that reality, and the examples are legion, far too many to quote them all, we see a society in which the vast majority of people are hungry, where, where there is scarcity of food and medicines, where there are three million people outside the country, and they are not. They're one of the leaders of the, of the uh, Venezuelan government, Diosdado Gabello, is a man who kind of runs the military end of things, <coughs> said, well, people are leaving because it's become fashionable. I thought this was 
of a depth of cynicism which scarcely bears thinking about. But of course, people in Venezuelans do not, by and large, emigrate. They never did. A few would go and come back again. They would travel. But there was no, there was no history of Venezuelans traveling out, leaving the country in the way that, for example, Colombians did to escape their poverty and look for a better life. And yet now nearly three million Venezuelans are outside the country. The rhetoric of revolution still comes out of the mouth of Nicolas Maduro. But the reality of, 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 um, of what of the, of the society is overseeing is, is, is the direct polar opposite of everything that was promised in that first era of the pink tide. If we go to Ecuador, where a Harvard economist claiming to be part of the same Bolivarian 21st century socialist movement, Rafael Correa, came to, to the presidency in 2007, he too has now left uh, Ecuador, and the promises that, he, that carried him to power are now being systematically, one by one, reversed. So what we have is, is a series of governments, which a series of leaders and organizations which came to power, carried there by the enthusiasm and by the, and, and, and by the, uh, the mobilization of millions of people, of the masses of ordinary people, carried them to power. But they didn't carry them to power in order to become just another ruling class, to substitute one set of rulers for another. They carried them on the basis of a promise that they would initiate a transformation of, of their society, where the oil and the gas would now yield benefits to all, where the economies which were dependent on one thing would diversify, would elaborate new areas of production so that that dependency on the world market would be broken once and forever. That was the promise. But it's a promise easily made. The, the, the problem was that in electing, uh, in, a, in a sense, the question was, how would this be carried out? How would you do it? What would be the instrument? And uh, the leaderships moved into the state. And in, in taking the state, taking over the state, one of two things could happen. One is that they would transform the state. Right? And it would become an instrument of a wholly different kind, a deeply radical instrument for the transformation of society, for the redistribution of wealth, and for the creation of a genuine grassroots democracy. That was one possibility. The other possibility, that the representatives would be taken over by the state, become just one more set of bureaucrats, one more set of functionaries, and act increasingly on behalf of the state and against the movement that has carried them there. Unfortunately, the history of these recent years is that. Um, there are two or three critical moments. One of them is what happened in the Tipnis National Park in Bolivia when a group of local farmers whose rights were protected by the new constitution um, uh, pro raised a, a protest march against the announcement by the government that a new road would be, would be opened straight through the territory to enable, uh, uh, well, pro fundamentally Brazilian and Argentine multinational companies to transport their goods to their markets in those countries, and therefore to destroy, really, the, the delicate ecology of the, of, of the world of the, of the peasant farmers. The government, the government of Evo, Evo Morales, the ex-leader of the coca farmers, the, the first indigenous president of Bolivia, sent the police and the troops to stop them. The, the project was stopped briefly, but it was then re-initiated, and it's now being built. It isn't just environmental destruction, it is, it is, also, it is fundamentally the negation of the most important social and political promises at the heart of of. Uh, of the, the promises that were made to the movements that brought these governments to power. In Venezuela, in 2015, after... Uh -huh, in, in Venezuela, uh, Hugo Chavez died in mysterious circumstances at the very beginning of 2013. <coughs> His successor, claiming to be, as it were, the guarantee of the continuation of that process of change, uh, was Nicolás Maduro, and he was elected to the presidency in April of 2013. In that same year, Hugo Chavez, and it's a complex issue what, what Chavez was doing, but anyway, his very last document, the last document Chavez wrote, was a, a thing called the Plan de la Patria, a, a kind of a, a six-year economic plan. But it had a preface, and this is the dying Chavez that wrote this, and the preface said, we undertook to transform the state. It has not happened. In some ways, the state has transformed us.
And then he said, what we have to do now is, and this is the phrase he used, is pulverize the bourgeoisie. But then he died, and far from pulverizing the bourgeoisie, the Maduro, two years later, to the sound of Chavez whirling in his grave, he announced that uh, an area called the Arco Minero, 12% of the territory of Venezuela, which is the area richest in minerals, in gold, in copper, in diamonds, in oil, in gas, it is a, it is a cornucopia of, of mineral wealth, would be given in, in concessions to 150 multinational companies. Now, this was, if this was not a reverse of the revolution, I don't know what was. Far from being democratic, under democratic control, far from being given for the benefit of the majority, these mineral resources were being returned to the very forces that had driven the population into wretchedness and poverty just 15 years earlier. The tide had turned completely. The wheel had turned completely. And in order to reinforce the point, Maduro not only announced that he would give 150 concessions to multinationals, he also announced that the whole region would be placed under military control and that the constitution would not apply in that area. The reasons for that were quite clear. It was an area with a large number of critically important indigenous communities for who, of whom, to whom this territory belonged. And their rights were protected, as were the rights of workers in these enterprises, by the constitution. By suspending the constitution, he not only gave permission for these uh, indigenous communities to be driven off their land, but also in a sense, but also suspended that element which gave to Venezuelans the right to protest, to fight back and to resist uh, where, where uh, measures were taken against their interests. So, and this was the beginning of a transformation, a, a fundamental transformation. Today, the, uh, there are many on the left around the world who feel because you know, Venezuela has been attacked by the right, it's been attacked by Mike Pence and Trump, it's been attacked by Bolsonaro, and therefore, on a simple equation, the enemy of my enemy must be my friend. It would be nice to think that, it was, that things were as simple as that, but if we look at what's happening, what's happened in Venezuela, if, if what's happened in Ecuador, what's happened in Bolivia, from the perspective of the interests of those masses of people who generated the pink tide, then we have to say that what is, what is being done in their name is dramatically and diametrically opposed to their interests in every sense. The Arco Minero will yield huge profits, and by the way, they don't have to pay any taxes for the next 12 years. Um, uh, will, the Arco Minero will not only destroy you know, a key part of the, Amazonian, uh, the Amazonian basin, that part which is in Venezuela, not only will it bring the impoverishment and, and expulsion of indigenous communities from their lands. Not only will it expel the miners in the region, it will, not only will it bring down the general uh, standard of living, but it will also divert all of the resources of Venezuela to the profit of multinational companies exactly uh, against the, the, the promise that was made 15 years before that. That's the reality of Venezuela, tragically. In Bolivia, exactly the same thing is happening. The... the um, the resources of the country have now once again been, uh, con have been, have been uh, conceded to multinational corporations. And the same is true of Ecuador. The, the, peop the, the, the fighters, the people who fought and resisted that neoliberalism in their time, are now, well, in, in Ecuador, for example, the indigenous movements have been criminalized and their leaders jailed. In, uh, in Venezuela, uh, what is increasingly an oppressive military regime because the government is half the government is military, <laughs> half the governors of the country are military, and the military effectively controls daily life and political life together with the ruling party, which is functioning exactly in the way that, ben that Chavez had criticized so profoundly and so insistently when he came to power as an instrument of patronage making some people rich at the expense of others. So corruption really is not only the reason for, but the expression of the abandonment of that project of profound social, profound democratic social change. One last thing to say, and that is, how do we address uh, socialists? How do we address the problem of corruption? 
Do we say that corruption, well, it's always going to happen because people are greedy and it's about human, you know, human failings and so on. That's a very easy, you know, wealth, lots of money, greed certainly influences certain people. And the people in, who now run the government in Venezuela proclaiming themselves revolutionaries. The government of Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, who was once a leader of the Sandinista revolution, now proclaims himself through his revolutionary rhetoric as conducting a, a, revolu as conducting a revolution in his country. And yet, it's a revolution which allows him to send the Sandinista the terrible irony of this, sending the police and troops against protesters, against the austerity programs he's imposing, and killing them in their hundreds. In Venezuela, people are also dying quietly, uh, also being repressed. Now, people will say, yes, but that's, that's what the opposition says. Of course it's what the opposition says. The opposition use, uses every opportunity it can get. Um, the, the, but, but we're faced with a dilemma. Why is it that given that this is the case, given that people are suffering now, why is it that Maduro is still there? Why is he still supported? Why is he still elected? And he is elected. And the reason for that is because the alternative is a, is an, a bourgeois opposition which has, which has nothing at all to offer any of those masses of people. They know them too well. They know their names, the families they belong to, the role they have played in Venezuelan politics for the last 50 and 60 years. They have no credibility. Meanwhile, those who use the language of revolution, um, in a sense, find them, uh, ju try to justify policies and politics which are bringing hunger, sickness, illness, and the disarming of those movements back into the, into the center of the picture. What do we do about it? I'm going to just use the, the, the words of a, of a young Venezuelan economist who belongs to um, an organization called Maria, um, uh, an organization of, of, of the left, who's one of the very few people, the Bank of Venezuela doesn't publish statistics anymore or any economic data whatsoever. He gets his data, I don't know where from, but this is what he says. Having told, having you know, described the, 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 the reality of Venezuela, he says this, the left should criticize the progressive governments with the same wisdom and insight that it applies to right-wing anti-working class regimes. There is no reason to ignore the problems that arise in those countries. The left should instead collaborate in an urgent search for meaningful proposals, and this will involve analyzing objectively the progressive governments and criticizing them with the methods of dialectical understanding. That's Manuel Sutherland speaking. I echo and reinforce those words. And that's directed not just in a general discussion about Latin America, but addressing one central problem which faces us now, and that is that um, the left is silent. Internationally, the left is almost entirely silent about what is happening in Latin America on the grounds that, you know, Ortega makes revolutionary speeches, Maduro makes revolutionary speeches. A very interesting and well-meaning uh, uh, North American who now has lived in Venezuela for many years and writes and says, well, we just have to expect that these are the difficulties that will apply and sooner or later they'll resolve them and things will go forward. But they won't go forward, they're going backwards. What we have to do at this time then is not only expose them, denounce them and say they are not acceptable in whatever language they are explained, but also to say that there was an alternative. The corruption arises not just from weakness, but from the but from, the marg from marginalizing those mass movements which carried these people to power from politics, disarming them, disorienting them, and in other words, resolving that, that, logic, that, that double logic, which that, you know, there were two logics at work as the big pink tide rose. One was a, a movement towards a deepening democracy, towards um, uh, open decision-making, towards the accountability of leaders. All of these were central demands in all of the movements of Latin America. The other logic was to turn those movements into mere electoral machines to carry new leaders to power, but at the same time to break that relationship of accountability, of responsibility of leaders to their, to their, to their base. Once that was broken... Once, there was, once the control over the leadership from the grassroots was lost, corruption followed, and there were plenty of people around, like Odebrecht, to provide the means, to provide the money, 
and to and to offer to offer the bribes and and then and then pull in the 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 the, um, the rich contracts that they would then get from these new state from these new new state bureaucracies. That's the reality of Latin America today, I think. So the pink tide was was uh, is in a sense is part of our is part of a radical history whose results, whose experiences we should reclaim, but make very very clear. At, the, at, what, at what point the pink tide, its aspirations, its lessons in grassroots democracy were abandoned in favor of something which, although it claimed its, rec- its rhetoric and its discourse, flowed in exactly the opposite direction. That's me.